2 Corinthians 6, 9 is where we're at. Okay? And you understand that what's being discussed, Paul tells the Corinthians, get in line with what I'm doing. And what's going on today? Jews and Gentiles in one body, according to the revelation of the mystery. And he says, be ye reconciled to the ministry of reconciliation. He starts off chapter 6, says, don't receive the grace of God in vain and go off half-cocked doing something that God's not doing. Okay? So, then he explains the difficulties in the ministry, uh, led by two prepositions, in and by. In these circumstances, we have these resources. And the resource in the middle of the buys is God the Holy Spirit, okay, is our supply, despite the circumstances, whatever they are. You know, folks tend to do, want to do what? Pray away the circumstances? Is that what God's doing today? He said sufferings are part of the ministry. And what do we need to learn how to do? And there's more. There's a plus. There's a plus. Okay, there's a plus. What happens when you temper metal? It gets hard. <laughs> you know? And, and here's the thing about the Ministry of Reconciliation. I heard a pastor say one time, you got to have the hide of a rhinoceros and the heart of a dove. A dove. Okay? But sufferings produce a capacity in us to serve God for all eternity. Okay? It's His design to leave us here in these present sufferings. Why do we suffer today? Yes? What's that? The kingdom on earth was what? Put off. On Israel's calendar, redemptive calendar, there's one week left, seven years long. And it was put off. Why? Oh, God wanted Israel to save Gentiles into the kingdom. Okay? So what did he do? He had a secret purpose. He's going to save men despite Israel. Right? Through the church, the body of Christ. He's taken, there's no difference. There's no circumcision and uncircumcision, right? Uh, you're not spiritual circumcision, spiritual Israel today. And Paul's saying, get with the program what God's doing. So what we started to look at is in, notice in verse um, 8, notice we're still with the buys, means, the means, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, we did that one, as unknown yet well known, remember we finished off on that last week, we're well known where? In the heavenly places, the principalities and powers, the angelic races. We're well known. We're written down in a book called the Book of Life. Remember we studied that last week? So we might not be known here and considered nobodies. Even in church history, believers, uh, uh, strong believers, they're not recorded. You know? They're not recorded. But we're well known. Now, what we're looking at today is as dying Behold, we live. Okay? Now, when it says dying there, dying isn't dead, is it? Dying isn't dead. Dying is, is perishing. Okay? Dying is perishing. It's not dead. We're still there. We still live in these bodies of sin. Our bodies are expiring. They're fading away. They're perishing, but we're still in them. Okay? Um, not dead. Like in Romans 6, it says we're dead. Take a look at Romans 6 6. Romans 6 6. Positionally, we've been equipped to walk faithfully and be spiritually minded. In verse 6, it says this, knowing this, that our old man... When you see that word old man right there, who is that a reference to? We just went through it in Romans chapter 5, right? Contextually. It's a reference to Adam. What did Adam do? 
he sinned. He says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the Paul can easily do this because of all that you went through in Romans chapter 5, right? Why am I a sinner? Because my dad's a sinner. And why is my dad a sinner? Because his dad was a sinner. And we can go all the way back to in Luke, right? Adam, the old man. So, you know, Christians, we're either in Adam or we're in Christ. You can't be in Adam and be in the book of life. Um, notice here what it says. That the body of sin, that's what you're wearing, might be, what? Destroyed. Interesting word, destroyed. Um, when I was driving out west, when I was young, and Mary and I would go through some of these areas out in uh, Wyoming and you know places like that, you'd look at the front yard or these huge properties, which are ranches, and you know what they'd have littered all over the property? Old vehicles. <laughs> Rust in old vehicles, tractors, cars. And you know what? Those things wouldn't run. You could tell by looking at them. They're destroyed, but are they still there? They're still there. They're not annihilated. They're destroyed. The body of sin today is destroyed. Its capacity to pull your chain no longer exists. No longer exists. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve what? Sin, which is in our members. Look at Romans 7. Romans 7. Well, look at, look at Romans 6.19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, the body of sin. We're sin resident in the body. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, okay, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and holiness. Put off, put on. When you were an Adam, your body had your soul and spirit chained to it. And you fulfilled the lust thereof. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. What did God do? Operatively, he cut you free from the body of sin so that you can make a choice. And you can now yield that body unto him. The thing that's destroyed is destroyed. Can't, do you want it to function anymore? No. And by your free will and by your spirit, your mind edified, built up in what God's doing and how to participate with him being enabled and comforted while still in this, you know, this dirty place. Doesn't look like it today, does it? But it is. Um, concerning our sanctification, we've been enabled to yield our body's servants to him to righteousness and holiness. Look at Romans 7. Romans 7. This is Paul's personal experience when he got saved. This is every Christian's personal experience. What does a Christian try to do when they first get saved? Not sin. So what do they do? They go like this. They quit a whole bunch of things that they used to do, and they, they go like this. Uh, and they try to hold all that stuff off. Right? They're going to keep the law. Performance-based acceptance. What happens? You can't do it. You sin. You get involved with sin. And what does that do to your Christian? The adventure of Christian living. And not only that, what does it do? It, it, it makes you despair of the Christian life. You go, this is, impo this is ridiculous. And then what do you have to do if you persist in Christian with Christians? You have to pretend. You have to fake it. And you develop this secret life. This secret life yielding to the body of sin. Right? Why? Because you don't know the mechanics of what God's doing today. You don't understand the gift system. You're under the law system. A performance-based acceptance. And you, as a failure in the Christian life, you start to despair of Christians. Or you play games. You hide. You, we wouldn't have to go, all of us, right? Where there are things, you have this experience, don't you? You know, and um, here's the thing is, do we have the videotape that shows you in every moment of life? No, and I don't want it. But who does? <laughs> Who's kidding who? 
you need to get out from under that system because Romans 6 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under what? Grace. A gift system. When you're under the law, what does it promote? What does it give motion to? Sin. This is what Paul's explaining in Romans chapter 7. His personal experience. Okay, Paul wasn't somebody special outside of any one of us. He had to learn this. First thing he did when he got saved was go right back under the law. And here's his experience. Take a look at verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What's Paul saying? You can't live under the law because sin is resident in the body. And to will is present, but to accomplish, to perform, is what? Paul can't find. So he says, For I know that in, that is in, my, I know that in me, me, that's the soul, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Well, that's a heck of a thing, isn't it? Is that the Christian life? For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. That's his experience. That was the Apostle Paul's experience when he functioned under the law principle. Okay, here's the law. Perform, and you get the blessing. Fail to perform, and you get the curse, the absence of blessing. Now, if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I can't beat this thing in my own strength. Okay? I can't beat it. I find then a law. Okay? You know the laws of thermodynamics? They're, they're laws that you can observe. Okay? I find a law. When I would do good, what's present with me? Evil is present with me all the time. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. If I'm going to delight in another type of law, Paul's not talking about the Mosaic Law. Every time he says law, you have to look at the context. He's talking about the law of the inward man. That is the operative surgery that God performed on you when you were baptized. When you were put into living union with Christ, okay, we say cribs. He circumcised you. Not physically, but what? Spiritually, cut you free from the body of sin. You don't, when it pulls, you don't have to respond. Okay, He regenerated us. How did He do that? God the Holy Spirit took up residence with our spirit. He indwelt us in the person of God the Holy Spirit. He baptized us. He placed us into living union with the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And then He sealed us in Christ. Can you get out? Can't get out? The seal on you in Christ is God the Holy Spirit. Now those things happened the moment you believed. And yet, if you go under the law and you try to make the flesh perform, it'd be like digging up your somebody digging up your corpse, pulling it out of the ground after it's been in there for a couple months and waving it at God. See? Cuz he destroyed it at the cross of Calvary when you first trusted in Christ, that gospel of the grace of God. Okay? It's a question of walking by faith or walking by sight. Okay, look at Romans 8 3. For what the law could not do, the law was never designed to make you righteous. You could have a state of righteousness, but only because in time past there was a foreshadowing system, which was called the tabernacle. And what did they do when they sinned? They spilt innocent blood, critters, right? You know the difference between a critter and you? They don't have a conscience. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Can you act like an animal? Yeah, you can take your conscience and scar it so it doesn't work anymore. It can't evaluate, right? What we call good and evil. And you get these monsters, right? You know, there's some famous ones, right? You know, they got body parts of people in their fridge, you know. You know, and, and, and they open the fridge and they get the orange juice right next to the body parts. It doesn't bother them a bit. What are they like? Isn't that exactly like an animal? As, an, as a predator is chewing up, right, an antelope, 
and it's screaming as it crushes its neck, right? With its teeth. And it starts chewing to eat, right? Does it have any compunction at all to continue doing what it's doing? That's the difference between a critter and you. They don't have a conscience. Any conscience that they have, you have to what? Train in them by punishing them one way or another for them to... So, so they have to rely on your conscience when you have domestic pets. It's like having a cat. A cat? Uh, we had cat for a long, couple cats for a long time and in two weeks with somebody else, they didn't even want to come by us. They didn't even know who we were. You know, cats are like that. They don't have any compunction, any moral governor, but we do. That's what makes us superior to the critters. We looked at Ephesus and they behaved like animals. They didn't even know why they were involved in this insurrection. They're just doing what? All the lemmings started running off the cliff, some of them, so all of them ran off the cliff. Um, Paul says here, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, spirit and soul. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the bondage of this death? They talk about the Christian experience. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind understanding, edified, built up in what God's doing, understanding the capacity that you have within you that you need to trust in instead of trying to do it in the flesh because you're so strong. Moral, you know, Strength is not talking about physical, it's talking about moral strength. Okay. With the mind, I, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Here's what we're to do with this destroyed thing. Uh, if you leave that car out there year after year after year, it's going to eventually do what? Be dust. It'll be dust. Okay. The body of sin, when you believed, was destroyed. Okay. And the inward man is a reference to your spirit, the spiritual part of you, two thirds of you. Okay. Which is able to do what? Say no to the flesh. But if it was just no, you couldn't do it. Under the gift system, you've been given gifts that allow you to put this off by your will and a mind okay, that knows what God's doing, understands it, knows the choice to make. Okay, Put off that and put on that new mentality, spiritual mind that you have and discern what to do at any given time that reflects who you are in Christ, not who you are in Adam. Any given time, he's equipped you like that. What happens if you don't get it in the spirit of your mind? The truth of what God's doing today, his purpose. How to use the resources, the grace, the gifts, the enablement that he gave you through the person of God, the Holy Spirit, indwelling you. What happens if you don't use it? Can you not use it? Can you not even know what it is? If you don't know the ministry of reconciliation like Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5 in the context we're in, you haven't even begun the Christian life. Only took me, I don't know, 15 years to learn this. Paul's learning it for 14 down in Arabia. Right? Now, I could have learned it faster, but I wasn't going to teach them. They could show it to me. You know, they just kept putting me under the law. And it's a good thing. I wanted understanding. I wanted to be understand the Bible for myself because I saw that so many people said so many different things. I said, I, I can't evaluate this. And I can't use the world's criterion because I don't walk by sight. Okay? Um, look, at, look at Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse uh, Colossians 2. Look at, uh, no, Colossians 3. And I want you to look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. 
And I want you to look at verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. So you got this body, and it's on the earth. Okay? Except when you fly. But what happens every once in a while? Plane malfunctions. And what happens to all those people? They come plummeting down to where? Earth. When it says mortify, what's that mean? Mortify your members, your body, the body of sin. It means kill it. Kill it. Kill it. Okay, mortify your members, mortify therefore your members which are upon, uh, upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. I'm not going to go through what all these are. Covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in the which ye also walked some time when ye were lived in them. Okay, now I'll stop at the but. The change in time and condition. But we're to kill the body of sin. It's been destroyed by God and on a daily, hourly basis we're to kill it. So that we know, what are we to kill? Our will to trust in it anymore in this life on the earth. Okay. Um, look at Romans 12.1, Romans 12.1, Romans 12.1, Romans 12.1. When I was first a Christian, it took me years and years to understand, fathom what this meant, this phrase. Okay. Uh, when you make a sacrifice, what do you do to it? In the old tabernacle system, when you sacrificed an animal, did you like um, give it a bath? Delice it? Okay. Like our dog, clean its ears, eyes, and cut its fur? No. When you sacrificed it, you did what? You killed it. You kill it. Notice, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, his mercy provided in this. You didn't have anything to contribute. That ye present your bodies, the fact that you could present your bodies to serve Him. A living, what? Sacrifice. Death, burial, resurrection. We were left in these bodies of sin that is destroyed and we need the mentality spiritually so that our heart can trust in that mentality. We call it faith. Cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's the object of our trust. And we need to understand that our bodies have been destroyed. Okay? Completely destroyed. And what are we to do with those destroyed bodies in Christ? Use them to serve Christ. So that makes us a living sacrifice. I told you, destroyed doesn't mean annihilated. Because we're still in these bodies, aren't we? Did your body change when you get, got saved? You got older. It didn't change, did it? What changed? Your spirit and your heart. See, your heart is a mentality also, but it's a mentality that you believe from. You believe in the mentality here, in Christ, in the inner man, Understanding. Okay? The enlightenment is the power of God today. Understanding. You trust in that and you store up in your heart what? What you do. Because the mentality in the heart does. Right? And you're known by your heart mentality. What you do. What you do. How you conduct yourself. Okay? Um, it looks up on the surface like a contradiction of terms living sacrifice. That's why you need to understand who you are in Christ and what you've been identified with, His cross work, death, burial, and resurrection. Not just the justification of your soul, but the sanctification of it. You can take the destroyed thing and use it to serve God when it served the prince and the power of the air formally. The author of sin. A critter. Um, take a look at 2 Corinthians again. 6.9 2 Corinthians 6 9. We read again, as dying, and I'm fascinated with this word, just like I was fascinated with um, unknown yet well known. What? Well known? Well known? We're well known? 
I'm well known. You're well known. Yeah, we had to study that through, didn't we? No, notice um, the next one here, dying, and the word is behold. Now, there's something attached to this word behold Okay, that you need to understand. It's a verb used as an adjective. Okay, And it has to do with, when in a sense, um, giving command or making a request. Defined, it means, obviously, behold, see. See this. And it also means... Look upon it with care. Look upon it with care. Behold. Okay. Um, there's a lot of things to see here, and you need to look carefully at them in regards to the context of the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry today. Okay. It's, the word behold is all over this context. Take a look at uh, 2 Corinthians 6.12. 2 Corinthians 6.12. Uh, sorry, 6-2. For he saith, quoting the Old Testament here, Israel's not going to go on to the Gentiles. We are. That's what we learn when we study this. I have heard thee in the time accepted, and the day of salvation have I secured. It means helped thee. Behold, take a good look at this. Now is the accepted time. God's saving Gentiles now through the church, the body of Christ, not Israel. He says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You can save by preaching souls, right, when they believe, and you can save your conduct and service so that it lives for eternity. It's a weight in all of eternity. How much is a small amount of weight in all of eternity? A lot of weight. More than I can measure. It's an infinite amount. Uh, take a look at 2 Corinthians 5.7. Not five seven. Five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold. See that? You need to give attendance to this. You need to take a good look at this and be careful when you do it. Behold, all things are become new. Do we function like time past saints? We do not function under the law like time past saints, performance-based acceptance. Okay, So when Paul says, behold, we live, there's something to notice here. And what time is it? Yeah. Noon? Yeah, I'll move real quick here. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 6.9 here again. And uh, put your finger there and go to Romans 6.10. Romans 6.10. I'll kind of go back and pick up the things that I omitted first time around. Romans 6.10 says, For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now that's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. He died to sin how many times? Once. And he liveth, and now who does he liveth unto? God the Father. God the Father. Take a look at um, 2 Corinthians 4, 10, and 11. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 11. Always bearing. Now that's interesting. There is no time, day by day, hour by hour, that there isn't the dying of the Lord Jesus going on in our destroyed bodies, the body of sin. That His life might be manifest in the destroyed body of sin by faith in the spiritually governed mind. When we're not focused on moral performance, but we're rather focused on Him and His life and His purpose and what He's doing in us by faith. Us trusting in who we've been made and the enablement that we have to live in Him through the words on the page, the living words on the page. Okay, um, Always bearing. We want his life manifest in this destroyed body of sin by faith in a spiritually governed mind. Look at verse 11. Verse 11. I'll read 10 and 11. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Um, at any time, can you get involved with sin? Well, why do you do that? 
Because you want to. Because you want to. Simple, right? Well, why did I do that? Because you want to. Because sin's not dead. You're dead to sin, but sin's not dead. Can you try to walk in the strength of your flesh? And what's guaranteed when you do that? What law? The law of sin and death. You're going to get involved with sin. Right? The law gives motion to sin. You trying to do it in your own strength, the only way the, Isra- the, the, the Israelites weren't a, a, a bloody spot on the ground is because he gave them a mercy system, a sacrificial system that foreshadowed Messiah because the law taught them that they needed a Savior. Okay, That's what the law taught them. They needed a saver, Savior. Verse 11, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Mortal means it's perishing, it's expiring. And his life needs to be manifested in, in this short little window that we're in right now. Okay, And it's short. It's a short time. Um, we're using, God is using in us the perishing part of us, the body of sin. The body of sin subject to death to conduct ministry. Ever think about it that way? He's using the perishing part of us to conduct ministry because He's enabled us to put off and put on the new man, the inner man, and tell the flesh what goes. Okay. Instead of the flesh telling us. Now, if you don't get enlightened in the spirit of your mind with the full assurance of understanding by the acknowledging of the mystery of Christ and God, it says in Colossians 2.2, 2, you're not able to do that. And your Christian experience becomes a big game. A big game. And that's what I did. I was involved with a group called the Navigators who thought of themselves as leaders of the church out of the military, and uh, I just couldn't play the game anymore. Because when I believed it was real, and I wanted it to be real, and I could not deal with sin under the law principle which they were teaching. Okay. Now, look at Colossians 3.2. We were there. Colossians 3.2. For sin shall not have dominion under you, for you are not under the law system, but under the gift grace system. Grace allows you, using the assets that you have in Christ, that life allows you to use this perishing thing, this destroyed thing. How long do you have to use, use it? As long as it's still walking around. What's it do day by day? It perishes. What's the inner man do day by day? It's renewed day by day. Grow stronger. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 2. Colossians 3, verse 2. Set your affections on things above, not things on earth. Now think about that one. The things that you're affectionate about, you know, that you desire greatly, are they on earth or are they in heaven? Well, the only, you, you don't know anything about heaven except it's blue and there are shiny things at night, right? And you like air that comforts your skin, right? Like today. You know, and you like that bright sunshine, everything's sparkly and looks brand new. Notice he says, don't set your affections on it. In order to set your affections on things in, in the heavens, what do you got to do? you got to know something, and the only way to know it is from the Word of God. And God intends to take the church, the body of Christ, and bring back the heavenly places under His rule and authority. Notice, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So the Christian life, to appearance, for sight's sake, is it hid? Does anybody know you're in the church, the body of Christ, when you walk down the street? And that you're well known in the heavens? And by believers on this, maybe, probably not. Believers on this earth. No. So what's said in the Scriptures? Your life in Christ on earth is hidden. People can't see it. 
It's only spiritual discerned your activity by believers. And righteous angels and even fallen ones learn from watching you. And those that function with his assets, his gifts, and those that don't. And how to hinder those, been going on for 2,000 years, hinder those with devices that cause them, 2 Corinthians 2, for example, forgiveness. Can you in your own strength forgive somebody? Ever try that? That's wronged you? Now, nah, ten years later, all of a sudden it comes up in conversation. You, you say, well, I forget it, but I forgive. Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. How do you do that? You lay it on who? Him. Did he pay for the forgiveness of sins so that your sins are paid for and forgiven? That's how you handle it. You handle it in the new man. Because in the old man, you can't forgive. Are you kidding me? Somebody wrongs you and what do you do? How many times would they have to bless you for you to take them off your blacklist? Uncountable is right. Now, the problem is you're attached to the body of sin and it's sight-based criterion um, of the performing of the flesh in the earth. Okay. Uh, look at 3 and 4 here. Uh, 4 says, When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. When is the day of hidden Christians on the earth over? When Christ comes for the church, the body of Christ, then ye shall what? Appear. Why? Because you're going to have a, a celestial body fashioned like unto His glorious body and you're going to appear and people are going to go, go, there goes a member of the church, the body of Christ. You aren't going to be defined by, by nationality. You're not going to be defined by race. You're not going to be defined by financial well-being. You're just going to be seen as a member of the church, the body of Christ in the heavenly places. And you'll appear and no longer will you be a hidden commodity. No longer. That's over. Okay, he says w w where we stopped. He says uh, in uh, verse ten, and have put on the new man. That's Christ. The old man's Adam. New man's Christ. The new man, which is renewed. Notice how it's renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So how do I forgive somebody else? Well, the best thing to do is look at myself and realize that he forgave what? Me. If he forgave me, can he forgive the person that wronged me? Yeah, he did. So I need to think about it the way he thinks about it. Not the way I think about it in the body of sin. Controlling things. Because you know what the body of sin will do? You can never, ever be forgiven by me. As far as I'm concerned, if you were run over by a giant truck and the truck went in reverse and rolled over you ten times, that's not good enough for me. Right? You know how folks are, right? So, in conclusion today, I'll, I'll read two passages. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified in Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm still walking around in this destroyed thing. He says, Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. Through the Holy Spirit in us, giving us enlightenment and understanding about what God's doing today. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Pretty popular passage in Christianity. You need to understand, know, understand what it, know what it means. Philippians 2.16, holding forth the word of life, that's the ministry of reconciliation, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. How does this chapter start in 2 Corinthians 6? 
Receive not the grace of God in vain. Get involved with what he's doing and what he's equipped you with. It'd be like leaving a whole bunch of presents unopened in your room and never opening them. Right? Remember that movie with Tom Hanks? There was one package he didn't open because he decided he was going to deliver it. (laughs) You think she opened that package? Yeah, the person that got, yeah, they open it. Why wouldn't you open these gifts? Because somebody puts you under the law right away and says, you don't need the gifts, you can do it. I couldn't do it before. It drove me to Calvary. How am I going to do it now? With the destroy, I need to use the destroyed thing. I don't want the destroyed thing to use me. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. Father, we're so thankful this morning that we could behold these things and uh, understand what the ministry is that you've given us and that you accomplish through the members of the church, the body of Christ on the earth. We're thankful for it. We rejoice in it. In our Savior's name, amen. Page 386, page 386.